Father, we thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name. We glorify your name, God. Father, I pray that you give me all trans, God, and grant your saints understanding. As we go through the book of Revelation, chapter 7, oh God, give us clarity, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Zion Fellowship Church. How are we this Sunday morning? The grace of the living God. And good afternoon to Mount Zion Fellowship Church in Ghana and in Sierra Leone. Praise God. So today we continue with our teaching, the book of Revelation. And today we are going to, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we are going to go through chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. And once again, I plead that you give me time so that we can go through this book. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will grant us understanding. Amen. 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 Praise God. Because in chapter 7, there was... An intervention in chapter 7. Amen? Amen. Amen. See, when we looked at chapter 6 last week, what we saw in chapter 6 was the judgment wind of God blowing on this earth. Amen? Amen. But now there's a temporary calm in the storm in chapter 7. Because when we leave chapter 6, when last week, when we leave chapter 6, the world was in a terrible mess. If you remember in chapter 6, the world was in a terrible mess. And the four horsemen were, were actually, or the apocalypses were running wild. They were stampeding over the earth. Crushing everything that got in their way. And when the sixth seal was opened, we see the world was falling apart. God has turned the light out of the sun. The stars were falling from their orbits. Millionaires and kings were running looking for a place to hide. That was chapter 6. Just to give you a synopsis of what chapter 6 was all about. And then we move to chapter 7. And you expect that chapter 7 will continue with the seventh seal. But that's not going to happen until chapter 8. So if you like, chapter 7 is the parenthesis there. You know, the parenthesis when we write a sentence, we put it, you know, those two things and then we say something, but if you remove the things that you put in parenthesis, it still makes sense. Yeah. And that's what chapter 7 is like. It's a buffer there. Alright? But it's also a very, very exciting chapter. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So, because if we remove chapter 7 and we went from chapter 6 to chapter 8, there is continuity. It makes sense. All right? Mm -hmm. So now you're wondering, well, why did God, you know, come in chapters, in chapter 7 and actually, you know, did what he did in chapter 7? So, in chapter 7 is the preview of things to come. All right? Mm -hmm. Because as we see the holocaust of the great tribulation breaks loose on the earth, there were two groups of people that God said that he was interested in. He has special interest in these two groups of people. And those group of people were one that he was going to seal and the other that he was going to save. So there was those two groups of people. Amen? Amen? So while the other groups were being saved, the others were being sealed. So we're going to see that the sealing of one group and the saving of the other group is directly due to the sovereignty of God. And, 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 I, and I hope we understand that. God, I pray that God gives me the clarity to explain this so that you understand about the sovereignty of God. Amen? Amen? Because God is always in control. Amen. God will always be in control. Amen. You know, sometimes we say, God is in control. We, we, it sometimes it sounds like a cliche. 
It sounds as if we're just saying that because we have nothing else to say, but God is in control. But no, God is absolutely in control. I'm going to see that in verse 8, chapter 7 of Revelation. Amen. Because so when you say God is in control, it's not, it doesn't mean that you're just saying that as a cliche. You're just saying that because, well, that's what everybody says. But today I hope that God will give us the understanding. So when we say God is in control, we know that he's absolutely in control. Amen? Amen. But let's look at, at verse 1, chapter 7. It says, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. And as we all know by now, the number four stands for what? It's the number of the earth, right? Yeah. And the phrase four corners simply means the four cardinal points, the east, the west, the north, and the south. Amen. So God sends four angels to the earth, to the north, to the east, to the west, and to the south, and instructed them to hold back the winds from blowing upon the earth. And now remember, in chapter 6, the world was in a mess, complete mess. And if you remember what I said last week, that was the first half of, this, of, of the whole of the seven years, of the first you know, tribulation, the three and a half years of the seven years. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So right in the middle of the storm, God intervened. It's because he's a sovereign God. Amen? Amen? So the wind, as we know, all know, represents what? It represents the wrath of God. So in chapter 6, we saw the beginning of God's wrath. But even the storm, you know, a greater storm was going to come in chapter seven, in chapter seven, although it didn't happen in chapter seven, it happened in chapter eight. So God intervened in chapter seven. Amen. Amen. And, and Jesus even referred to the wind, the, the, the tribulation in, in chapter six, as what? As the beginning of sorrows. Mm. Amen? Amen. So now the world was ready to brace itself for the second half of this great tribulation. But then God sends his angels and instructed them to hold the winds, the mighty winds. And winds in the Bible is often a symbol of judgment and the wrath of God. And you remember Job, when one of his servants came to report to him in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 19, this is what the Bible says. It says, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young men and they are all dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. So always the wind is the wrath of God. And again if we look at the book of Jeremiah 49 36 was to do with the Elamites. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because they thought they had power all by themselves. They can do what they wanted to do. I was looking at I, I wanted to know what the actually crime they actually committed that God would allow this wrath upon them, but there's nowhere you could find exactly what they did. But this is what Jeremiah 49 um, 36 says. It says, Against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of the earth. Okay, there's the four winds and the four quarters. Amen? Amen. And scatter them toward all winds. There shall be no nation where the outcast of Elam will not go. So wind means what? The wrath of God. But here God sent his restraining angels, amen? amen, to temporarily dam the river of his judgment and bring peace before the storm. So there was a buffer there in chapter 7 between the first great tribulation and the second tribulation. Amen? amen. But this is not a divine, you know, this is, this is not... Uh, a temporary peace. It wasn't a peace of diplomacy. It wasn't a peace because we were praying and asking God to bring peace. No, it wasn't any of that. What it was was purely the sovereignty of God. It is the sovereignty of God, not the power of man, not our prayer that holds uh, held back that wind that, that was supposed to have been blown. Amen? Amen? So the sovereignty of God, in my estimation, is the bedrock of theology. Okay? That is the bedrock of theology. It is the time to remember when hell was in, when and everything was going crazy. But God took a break and gave hell a holiday, if you like. Mm. I mean, that just goes to show that in everything that we are going through with this coronavirus, God is in control. He can put his tongue to it anytime. Mm. But when we say that, people look at you, they think you are crazy. But the Bible is telling us that that's what God did in, the, in Revelation chapter 7. He put his tongue to the storm. He instructed his angels to do that. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And that's why I want us to understand that that word is not a cliche. Mm. 
It is, it, it is, it, it, you know, well, it's just the will of God. If God, no, no, no. God is always in control. Amen? And I'll keep emphasizing that so that we get it. So when you say it, you mean it. All right? Not just a cliche. All right? So, and as, we, as I said in chapter 6, we saw that the devil was running, you know, rampage on the earth. But this day of calamity, this day of catastrophe, God was in total control. God puts everything on a temporal hold at that moment. Why? Because he had two special interests, two groups of people. One he had to seal and the other he had to save. So God can do anything for his people. Amen. He can actually mark you and say, look, the coronavirus will not touch you, will not touch you, will not touch you with or without masks. He can do that. Yes. I'm not I'm not advocating that you don't wear your mask, that's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But God stopped that calamity for those two groups of people. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And the Bible clearly teaches us that nothing happens unless God causes it. Mm -hmm. Or God allows it to happen. Amen. If anything could come, and if anything could happen, and it's not caused by God, and God didn't allow it, then it means that thing that had happened had power over God. It means God is not a sovereign God. Amen? Amen? And if God is not a sovereign God, then God is not God. Are you with me? Amen. So God is always in control of anything and everything that happens because He's the creator Amen. of the heavens and the earth and Amen. everything Amen. in between. Amen? Amen? Because some people think that, you know, God has taken a, is an absentee deity. He created the world in seven days and he's gone to sleep. He's sitting behind the driving wheel. Everything is on automatic. No, it's, it is not. It's a big mistake. Amen? Amen? And so that's why people think, you know what, everything is to do with fate. You know, if something good happens to you, it's good luck. If something bad happens, it's bad luck. There is no God. Well, no, I paint a different picture, all right? Because the Bible teaches that man proposes for what God does. God proposes. And nothing or no one can foster the sovereign plan of our great God. Amen? Amen. Nothing and no one can disrupt the sovereign plan and the power of our great God. So even in the middle of a time such as the great tribulation, we can confidently sing, have faith in God. He is on the throne, have faith in God. He watches over his own. He cannot fail you. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's look at these mysterious seals. Why God just hold back the wind of his judgment? Why did he do it? Well, why does he suspend his wrath in favor of his mercy? It is because there are special people who need to be sealed from the wrath that is to come. Let us go to verses 2 and 3. And the word of God says, then I saw an other angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. God sends his angels from the east. Where does the sun rise from? Yes. Okay, so this was God's, you know, um, sunrise angel. Amen? Amen. For the phrase literally means rising from the sun. Okay? And the angel of mercy to seal the servants of God, the people of God, now raises two vital questions. Why? Okay, so what is this seal? Let's look at the seal. What does the seal mean? A seal. Let's, let's look at that seal. Because we all remember back in ancient times, you know, in, 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 the, in the olden days, the kings will have a ring and that ring there's a sign in there and that's in this um, and the king wants to see the document to get somebody to write a document for him they'll spell out everything that he wants in that document and then they'll melt a wax and the king will then put his ring in that wax wax and then he will seal that document and once that document is sealed that becomes you know a sign of sovereignty that he is in control okay nobody can change that Right, that's what it means. If we, if we look in the book of Esther 8 8, remember with Haman and Mordecai? And Mordecai yeah. Yeah. When um, Haman went to the king and said that these Jewish people, you know, you've got to get rid of them. And the king said, You go and write whatever you want to write, but write it in my name, and then I will seal it. And once the king sealed what, what, uh, what Haman wrote, 
that was it. Okay, in the book of Esther 8:8. 8, 8. All right. So that's what it is. So the seal also is a sign of possession. All right. So anything containing the king seal belongs to the king once he has put that seal on it it belongs to the king amen, amen. so god we all belong to god once god has put a seal on you you now belong to god amen, amen. and god has always has a way throughout the ages you know to to, to to put a mark on his people you remember with moses all right mm -hmm. he had a covenant with him right mm -hmm. that was the seal remember with abraham as well it was the rite of circumcision that was the seal. All right. I remember the Passover. Many of the Passover when the children of Israel were marked by the blood. You know, when they had the blood on the on the doorpost, so that the angel of death can pass away. Again, that was a seal. Amen. So God always sealed and protected His people, because reading the book of Ezekiel nine one to seven, it says, "We are told a man clothed with linen, uh, with an inkhorn at his side." who was commanded to go through Jerusalem and mark the forehead of those who were loyal to God before the wicked were destroyed. So these people are sealed and marked, showing that they are God's special people. Amen? Mm -hmm. God's special people. So I said that the seal what? It is a sign of possession. The seal also is a sign of protection. Its ownership assumes the responsibility of protection. So God is always saying that he is taking full responsibility for the protection of his people, for the protection of his servants. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the seal also is a sign of power. Are you with me? Yes. But, you know, it's not... So, so that power is whoever is behind that ring, all right, exercising authority. You know, as strong as you're able, when the king wears that ring, when the king puts a mark on it, he, the king, has power. Amen? It gives the king power. And so the seal tells us that behind every servant lies the protection of God. So as a servant of God, you know that you are protected. He's got that seal. He's got, you're going to be protected. Amen? Amen? So, and it is a visible seal. This is not like a symbolic seal. No, it's a visible seal because verse 11 tells us that. They said it's what is on their forehead. Alright? So they can't be seen. When, 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 when with, with um, Abraham, the rite of circumcision was a visible one. Alright? Again, with the children of with the Passover of the children of Israel, when they were marked by the blood of the of, of the of the on the doorpost. Again, that was a physical, you can see it. Okay? It was physical. So the mark we're talking about is a physical uh, mark. It is visible. So let's let's look at Revelation 41. I'm just you know jumping ahead here just to make that point clear. And it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. All right? The father's name written on their foreheads. So the seal is the name of God, our heavenly father. That is all the protection the righteous need. Amen? Because the book of Proverbs 18 says, tells us that you know that the name of the lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to eat and they are safe amen yeah. so but who are these servants we talked about the seal let's look at the servants who are these servants that god will stop the storm seal and save and then go back and continue who are these servants because you know there's a group of people called the 144,000, okay? And the scripture tells us, you know, if you walk the mouth out, there were 12 tribes of Judah and each one of um, the 12 tribes of Israel. And in each tribe, there were 12,000, you know, that were part of this 144,000. So if you calculate it, 12 times 12 is 144,000, okay? Uh, and so at least the 144,000 are going to come from the particular group. And we all know they're going to come from the tribe of Israel, all right? And I know when I, I, I was um, by my parents with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they used to say that the, the, the founder of that organization um, was one of the 144,000. But this was in Pennsylvania, all right? The leader was born in America. He was from Pennsylvania because that's where the headquarters was. So if the Bible is telling us that these are the tribes of Israel and you're not an Israelite or a Jew, then that's going to be 
Mm. All right. Mm. Praise God. Mm. Uh, and so, we are told in verse 4 that they are the tribes of the children of Israel. These servants are Israelites. They are Jews. They are the nations of Israel. That's what verse 4 tells us in, in the book of Revelation 7. So, he identified that group. Amen? Praise God. Mm. And they are those who tell us that the 144,000 are evangelists, okay, who go, they are Jewish evangelists who go out in the world preaching. Okay, that could be the case. But here the book did not tell us, you know, um, what they do, but it tells, simply tells us who they are. So again, we've got to be very careful that, okay. The Bible never tells us what they do, but it clearly tells us who they are. So we've got to be careful of these distinctions, okay. okay. Are, you, are you all with me? Yes, yes, Praise God. Amen. Pray that God gives us all you know, understanding. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So, I, I, I personally believe that the key to understanding what God is telling us here is to remember how numbers are used in the book of Revelation. Okay? And I don't want to go into too much details because we all know that um, the number 12 stands for, it's a governmental number. Alright? Mm -hmm. I know there are 12 months in the calendar. We all know that. Alright? We know that you know, that just tells us that, you know, um, God is in control. You know, there are 12, you know, um, signs of zodiac. We all know that, all right? And we also know that, you know, it's also, 12 also symbolizes, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And then again, when we go back to the Old Testament, you know, on the breastplate of the high priest, there were 12 precious stones, and each of those stones were representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, we are, you know, you're, you're with me, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and it, that's what it represents. So, again, when we talk in the great city of New Jerusalem, there are 12 gates, and each of those gates, you know, is written in the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, so again, in the book of Revelation, there are going to be numbers, and those numbers they mean something as well. All right, and then um, we look at the number 10. We know that number 10 stands for completeness, all right? So basically what that is telling us is that the 144,000 is a symbolic reference to the entire and complete nation of Israel, okay? And God's rule over that nation. Are you with me? In other words, what we are being taught in this verse, in this verse is simply this. God is not through with the children of Israel yet. The Jews has a place and purpose in the plans of God. Amen? Amen. And, and, and there are some people who believe that God has finished with the Jewish people. That he has no place for them anymore. But all you have to do is to look up to the sun and the moon. Amen? Amen. And the stars. And you will know that that is not true. And I'm sure most of you are looking at me, James, man, and what has God not got to do with the Jewish people? That the hand of God is not upon them. But let's go to the Bible. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, 35, 36. Let's see what the word of God says. This is what the word of God says. It says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon, and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea, and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, says the Lord, then the sea of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. That's what the word of God says. So as long as the moon is there, the sun is there, the, the children of Israel will be with God forever. And we can still see the moon and the stars, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's what the word of God says. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the sun and the moon and the star mm -hmm. will cease to exist before the nation of Israel will cease before the face of God. Amen? Amen. And if we're going to talk about the mystery really, and the miracles of the, of, of the nation of Israel, we'll be here all day talking about that. Okay, that's a whole entire difference. But just it's sufficient to say that Israel is still the chosen people of God. We all of over 4,000 years, you know, it's been, it will be resulted, you know, um, resulted in the slaughter of you know, millions and millions of Jews. And up to 2,000 years ago, we see that again, the attack of the Jewish people, but still, they are God's covenant people. God made an unconditional promise with them. And if you look in the book of Jeremiah, the same book of Jeremiah 31.10, this is what it says. It says that 
He is even the process. He is even in the process of keeping today here, oh, hear the word of God, oh nations, and declare it in the eye afar off and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Amen. All right. So still, Israel is under God's protection. Hallelujah. Amen. You mean there are nations who have been uh, alienated throughout centuries, civilizations they were once there and are never there again, and the Antichrist will gather the greatest army seen in the history of the world for all the single purpose of why to alienate the nation of Israel. But Romans eleven twenty six tells us, but the Lord will return at the battle of Armageddon, rescue His people, and they shall look upon Him who has pierced for their sin. And all Israel, we are told, in the book of Romans, will be saved. Mm -hmm. Amen. Why am I making an emphasis on this? It's just to make the point to us that once God has marked you, has sealed you, no matter what happens, you are under his protection. Amen. Yes. All right. Amen. That's the point I'm trying to make. I know I've labored on it. But I want you to get that point. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. Okay. So let's move. We talked about the people who are going to be sealed. We said there are 144,000. All right. But let's look at the, at, at the ones that are going to be saved in verse 9. Okay. So we're going to leave the people who were being sealed and now we're going to see the people who are going to be saved. Because we know that where sin abounds, what abounds? Grace also abounds. Right. Mm -hmm. So the world's greatest revival will take place during the, the, this period known as the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. For not only will there be a time of great rebellion, but also be a time of great revival. Mm -hmm. We're going to see the gospel, you know, just, you know, cascading, just, just, just being preached around the world mm -hmm. to untold numbers of unsaved people. Mm -hmm. And now, who are these people who come to know Christ during this great tribulation? Mm -hmm. let, let, let's look at their the identity. Let's, let's go, you know, we're going to go to verse um, 13. But we are told of a vast, you know, um, a group of people okay they were in white robes with palm branches in their hand all right who are they and what 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 what, what, what was going on because john asked the question he asked the question in verse 13 that who are these people and let's read verse 13 he says then one of the elders answered to the question that john asked okay then one of the elders answered saying to me who are these arrayed in the white robe and where did they come from and the answer is given in verse 14 he says and i said to him sir you know so he said to me these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these are tribulation saints they are called mm -hmm. They are the tribulation saints. These are the Christians who have, who have gone through great tribulation, who have lost their lives and gave up their lives for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. They are called the tribulation saints. If you remember when, when last week, you know, the, 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 those who were, wow. when the seal was open, we said there was a blood under the altar, mm -hmm. right? And they were in a brazen um, cup and they went to where heaven and they were all robed in white but god said to them wait because there are others who are coming to join you okay. you remember yeah okay all right so it's that same group of people all right we, um, as i just explained there were some who are going to join them okay so these are the great tribulation saints christians who have refused to take the mark of the beast hmm. their blood will flow like a mighty river but it will be as an everlasting testimony to our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember Pastor, late Pastor Sally and I had this conversation that they were going to, to see a church, myself, him and Dr. Usman, we're going to see a church in Gettysburg and we are driving in the car. And I remember exactly where we, 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 we were when the late Pastor Sally asked me that question, Pastor Mana, what would happen to those who do not receive the back of the beast? Mm. He asked me that question. So what did the Bible say? He tells you what would happen to those who do not receive the mark of the beast. There will be the tribulation saints. Amen? Amen? Because they are the ones who will give the testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Mm. Amen. Amen. And that's why as believers, we've got to understand the book of Revelation. <clears throat> we've got to understand what is going on. We've got to understand we can't attribute everything to science. We can't attribute everything to technology. Mm. We've got to be smart in the things of God and open our spiritual eyes and ears in order to understand what is happening. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. So those are the sins of the tribulation. But then, notice. So well, let's talk about the numbers here, okay, in verse 9. This is what it says. It says that after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number. All right? That doesn't mean you couldn't count them, but if you look at this multitude, it was so huge, it's difficult to guess how many people were there. All right? So the Lord said, you know, that there are going to be so many people there that you will not be able to, even to number them. You will not be able to count them. But here we are told that the number of the people who are in heaven that were killed during the tribulation are so great that no one could number them. But sometimes we say there are going to be more people in hell, right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus is telling us that there's a huge crowd, lots of people who are going to be there. And I wonder about these people. You know, when we say that, oh, look at this church, it's so big, they're not, you know. But just imagine if you have a choir of a thousand people singing in unison to God. If you have 5,000, if you have 10,000, can you imagine how wonderful that is going to be? Mm -hmm. And that's what it's going to be like in heaven. That's what we're going to be doing in heaven. We're going to be worshiping God in heaven. Amen. It's going to be, you know, it's, going, it's, going, it's just going to be absolutely wonderful in heaven. Amen. And verse 9 also tells us, it talks about different nationalities, you know, different tribes, different people, different tongues. You know, centuries back, Christianity came to Africa from America, from England, from different parts of the world. You know, back then they could say, look, we are a Christian nation. But today, you look at Africa, you look at, you know, um, in, in India, you look at other parts of the world. You know, there are Christians everywhere today. The gospel message is just moving so fast and rapidly that it is unbelievable that no one country can say we are a Christian nation because Africa is just exploding. You know, you go to South Korea, you, you go to, 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 to China, even Christianity is just exploding. And that is what is happening in the last days. All right? That we can all say, yes, we are Christian nations. Nobody owns a monopoly anymore on Christianity. Okay? But I can simply say that we have never been further away from being a Christian nation than we are right now. Mm -hmm. Countries are emerging. Numbers are growing. The people are being converted. Don't listen to what other people say because I can prove that in the book of Isaiah 2 too. Mm. Amen? Amen. Amen? Praise God. Amen. Amen. But this verse also tells us that the gospel message is going to be heard throughout the entire world. And let's go to scripture. What Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. This is what Jesus said. He said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached into the, you know, unto the entire world before the end of time would come. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's what I'm saying. My prayer is that we're going to go to the remotest parts of the world Amen. and plant, even if they're not called churches, go on them home if you like. Amen. I don't care whether there are four or five people there as long as we're teaching the word of God. Amen. Amen. If we've got a thousand places, four or five people, hey, hallelujah, praise Amen. be to God. Amen. 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 But our, our, our mission, our vision, our purpose is to go to the remotest part of the world. And that is what is happening in Mount Zion right now. Amen. God is taking us to places that nobody wants to go to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And, and I also want us to look at the nature of his people. All right. They, they, what they were, they, they, they are clothed. The Bible says that they were clothed in white robes. All right, and they were holding branches in their hands. I will all know what the robe, the, the robe refers to their purity, right? White mm -hmm. refers to purity in, in the Bible. And what, the, what does the palm represent? It represents praise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, because we all remember that when the Lord Jesus Christ was entering to the, the city of Jerusalem, you know, they spread palm branches on the road and people were waving palm branches, singing praises, you know, and crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Am I right? Yeah. So that's what the branch is. That's what these people had. They had branches in their hands, right? But 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 look, let's look at the vitality of these people. 
All right, because that is what um, verse 10 is talking about. Let's look at the vitality of these people who were there. These people who could, these, these new not people who were, who were in heaven. Let's look at the vitality. That's what verse, let's see. Let's go to verse 10. Verse 10 says, And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So, what do we do? These people were shouting praises. They were so excited. Thousands and thousands of them singing praises unto the Lord, rocking heaven's hallway with praises unto the Lord. You know, it's calling it's praising God for, for, for their salvation. The worship was contagious. That even the, 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 the elders and the, and the angels wanted to join in. But listen to what the Bible says in verses 11 and 12. It says, And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying amen. amen blessing and glory and wisdom thanksgiving and honor and power and mind be to our god forever and ever amen. Amen. amen you know what we're going to do this afternoon you're going to stand on your feet you see that is a song am i right mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yes, sir. that's a song and that is coming directly from revelation 7 12 all right so you are going to sing like the tribulation saints in heaven and i'm going to ask the choir to lead us in that okay. because we are going to worship for a, bit, a minute or two this afternoon are you with me okay. and i just want you to sing unto the lord praise god because that is what you're going to be doing when you get to heaven amen, amen. and i'll tell you the reason why but i just want us to stand on our feet if you can and i just want us i just want us to you know hallelujah i'm coming to a close you know, when we come to think about how Jesus came into this earth, died for us, saved us, filled us with the Holy Spirit, prepares a place for us in heaven. And even as I teach this message, it just makes me feel like shouting. Amen? It makes me feel like shouting. And I do shout when I'm at home. Because sometimes my wife has something wrong. I said, no, there's nothing wrong. Because if it doesn't move you, then there's something wrong. Amen? But let's move from the vitality, the unending vitality of this world. Let us look at their unending activity. Amen? Because the word of God says in verse 15, it says, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple and the word for serve here is in the present tense okay it literally means we continuously serving God all right day and night okay now, how many of you have, have this dream that when you go to heaven you'll be in that bed of cloud just lying there Okay, eating grapes and somebody playing the harp. Okay, and the angels bringing you tea. Okay, is that is that your vision? Well, I have got news for you. Let me go back to the text. The text says, all right, it says, therefore, they are before the throne of God and they serve day and night in the temple. So you're gonna be serving God day and night in the temple, okay? Day and night, there's gonna be no sweet walk in heaven. There's no vacation in heaven. There is no break, there's no coffee break in heaven. Amen. Praise God. You are going to be serving God day and night. So if you cannot serve God here now, day and night is gonna be a challenge for you. You may say, Well, Pastor, in my glorified body, so I'll be able to do it. But he wants you to worship and serve him here right on that, okay? Because because that's not what heaven is about. It's not about us sitting there with a hollow and we bleed a half in yes, yes. grace. You know, I, I, that, that's, that's heaven. That's boredom. Amen? That's boredom. All right? Because in the Old Testament, we see that the Levites and the priests were the ones who went to the temple, prayed for the people. Okay? But in heaven, all of us, all the Christians, we're going to be there praising, worshiping, serving God. Amen? You're going to serve God. You're going to praise the Lord. Because there's nothing more to do just than to praise God. It's not like coming to church on Sunday and just sit at the back, just listening to someone and prayer, and then you go home. It's not going to be like that. Amen. I mean, there are no backseaters. 
You come late, you leave early. No, there's no such a thing. All right? So that's why we need to start practicing now. Amen? Praise God. All right? So let, let's move to verse 16. Verse 16 says, I'm coming to a close. He said, They shall neither hunger anymore or thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. Amen? So these tribulation saints who had endured the worst in the, that the world had given them will not enjoy the best that God has for them. Alright? So now the choice is yours. Do you want to suffer here for Christ and get the best of God? Or get the best here? That's up to you. Amen? Because the, the, the Lord meets every single need of these people. Alright? They miss all their needs. You know, this is what he says. He said they no longer have needs. He's taking all their needs. They will not hunger for food anymore. They will not be thirsty anymore. They will not need shade anymore. Because God has taken care of everything. But let's go to verse 17. And verse 17 says, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. Okay? But this, this is quite an amazing turnabout here. Alright? Because now the Lamb has become what? The shepherd. The Lamb has what? Has become the shepherd. And the Lamb is the Lord. And the Lord is my shepherd. Are you with me? Amen. So we have seen the Lord, you know, soothes these people, taking care of the, the, the tribulation saints. Because he said, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. These tribulation saints who have walked the highway of, 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 of punishment, of, of persecution, okay, and they left this world, you know, through the gates of grief and left behind them trails of tears. But the Bible says, for they will have have every one every tears from their eyes there will be no more tears mm. oh it's gonna be such a wonderful thing to go to heaven where the lord will be our shepherd forever and ever amen and i'm sure we all know these words let's go to verse 15 and there's a word there that says therefore all right but let me read the verse 